been chilled to the bone. What can Freddy be doing all this time? He's been gone 20 minutes. Oh, not so long, but he ought to have got us a cab by this. We don't get no cab, not for life past 11 misses, when they finish dropping off their theater fares. Oh, but we must have a cab. We can't stand here till half past 11. It's too bad. Well, ain't my fault, missus. If Freddy had a bit of gumption, he would have got one at the theater door. Oh, what could he have done, poor boy? Other people got cabs, why could it be? Well, how did you go a cab? There's not one to be had for love or money. Oh, really, Freddy, there must be one. You can't have tried. It's too tiresome. Do you expect us to go and get one ourselves? I tell you, they're all engaged. The rain was so sudden, nobody was prepared, and everybody had to take a cab. I've been to Charing Cross one way and nearly to Ludgate Circus the other, and they were all engaged. Did you try Trafalgar Square? There wasn't one at Trafalgar Square. Did you try? I tried as far as Charing Cross Station. Did you expect me to walk to Hammersmith? You haven't tried at all. Oh, really, Freddy, you are very helpless. Go again <laughs> and don't come back until you've found a cab. I shall simply get soaked for nothing. What about us? But we stay here all night in this drop with next to nothing on you, selfish pig. Oh, very well. I'll go. Now then, Freddy, look where you're going, I. Sorry. There's manners for you. All my blooming boiled eggs trod in a mud. How do you know my son's name is Freddy, pray? I wish your son is he. Well, if he's done your duty by him as a mother should, he'd know better than to spoil the poor girl's flowers and then run away with that pie. Will you pie me for him? Do nothing of the sort, mother. The idea. Oh, please allow me, Clara. I'm happy with the pennies. No, I have nothing smaller than sixpence. I'll give you change for a ten of my lady. Give it to me.
Martin. He ain't a tech, he's a bloomin' busybody, that's what he is. I tell you, look at his boots. <laughs> and tell me all your people down at Selsey. Who told you my people come from Selsey? Never you mind, they did. And how do you come to be up so far east? You were born in Listen Grove. What's the other more leave in Listen Grove? <laughs> it was a fit for a pig to live in, and I had to pay four and six a week. Live where you like, but stop that noise. Oh, come, come. He, he can't touch you. You have a right to live where you please. <laughs> Park Lane, for instance. I'm not getting this housing question with you, Edward. I'm a good girl, I am. Can you tell where I come from? Hoxton. You say I'm not. Blimey, you know everything you do. Ooh. Ain't no call to meddle with me, eh? Of course he ain't. Don't just stand it from him. Now see here. What call you to know about people what never off to meddle with you? Where's your warrant? Yeah. yeah. Where's your warrant? Let him say what he looks. I don't want to have no truck with him. You take us for dirt on your feet, don't you? Can't you take a little piece with the gentleman? Yeah. Turn away from it. You won't go fortune telling. <laughs> Cheltenham, Harrow. Cambridge and India. Quite right! <laughs> hey, you know, it's all about it. Uh, may I ask, sir, do you do this for a living at a music hall? I thought of that. Perhaps I shall someday. He's <laughs> a gentleman, he ain't interfere with a poor girl. What on earth is Freddie doing? I shall get pneumonia if I stay in this drought any longer. <laughs> oh, Oh, did I say that out loud? I didn't mean to. I beg your pardon. Uh, your mother's Epsom, unmistakably. Oh, oh, very curious. I was brought up in Large Lady Park, near Epsom. <laughs> what the devil of a name! Uh, excuse me. You want a cab, do you? Don't dare speak to me. Oh, please, please, Clara. We would be most grateful to you, sir, if you found us a cab. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I know you was a plain clothes copper. That ain't a police whistle, that's a sporting whistle. It's no wrong to take away my character. <laughs> my character's a sign to me, is any lie? I don't know whether you noticed it, but the rain stopped about two minutes ago. <laughs> oh. So it has. Why didn't you tell us all before? Uh, and that's losing our time standing around listening to your silliness. I can tell where you come from. You come from Anwill. Go back there. Hanwell. Oh, thank you, teacher. <laughs> so oh, good. Oh, and them people up there. How would he like it himself? It's quite fine now, Clara. We can walk to a motor bus. Come. But the cab. Oh, how tiresome. Poor oh, girl. Hard oh, enough to live without being worried and chivvy. Oh. How do you do it, by the way? Oh, simply phonetics. The science of speech. That's my profession. Also my hobby. Happy is the man who can make a living by his hobby. Now, you can spot an Irishman, a Yorkshireman, by his brogue. I can place any man within six miles. I can place him within two miles in London, and sometimes within two streets. Ought to be ashamed of himself. The unmanly coward. But is there a living in that? Oh, yes. Quite a fat one. Uh, See, this is an age of upstarts. People begin in Kentish Town with eighty pounds a year and end in Park Lane with a hundred thousand. They want to drop Kentish Town, but they give themselves away every time they open their mouths. Now I can teach them how to speak. Let him on his own business and leave a poor Woman! girl. Woman, cease this detestable boo-hooing instantly, or else seek the shelter of some other place of worship. I've rocked a beer, Marlocks. I miss you. A woman who utters such depressing and disgusting sounds has no right to be anywhere. No right to live. Remember that you are a human being with a soul and the divine gift of articulate speech, and that your native language is the language of Shakespeare and Milton and the Bible. And don't sit there crooning like a bilious pigeon. Ah! <laughs> what a sound. Ah! God. <laughs> you see this creature with her curved stone English, the English that will keep her in the gutter till the end of her days? Well, sir, in three months, I could pass that girl off as a duchess at an ambassador's garden party. I could even get her place as lady's maid or shop assistant, which requires better English. That's the sort of thing I do for commercial millionaires, on the profits of which I do genuine scientific work in phonetics, and a little as a poet on Miltonic Now, uh, I am myself a student of Indian dialects. Oh, do you know Colonel Pickering, author of Spoken Sanskrit? Well, 
I am Colonel Pickering. Who are you? <laughs> Henry Higgins, our third Higgins Universal Alphabet. I came from India to meet you. I was going to India to meet you. Where do you live? 27A Windpole Street. Come and see me tomorrow. Uh, I'm at the corner. Come with me now and let's have a jaw over some supper, eh? Right you are. Well, do you buy a flower, kind gentlemen? I'm short for my lodging. I really haven't any change, I'm sorry. Liar, you said you could change half a crown. You ought to be stuck with nails, you ought. Here, take the old blooming basket for six pence. Well, here I am, ready to pay. I'm asking no favour. 
They treat me as if I was dead. How can you be such a foolish, ignorant girl as to think you could afford to pay Mr. Higgins? Well, I should not. I know what lessons cost, same as you, and I'm ready to part. How much? Now we're talking. I thought you'd come up when you saw the chance of getting back a bit of what you talked to me last night. You did drop in, didn't you? Sit down. What, if you're going to make a compliment of it? Sit down! <laughs> Sit down, girl. Do as you're told. Uh, won't you... with four eggs in it. They took one apiece and left three in it. <laughs> uh, don't be silly. You mustn't speak to the gentleman like that. Why won't he speak sense of what I mean? Come back to business. How much do you propose to pay me for the lesson? Oh, I know what's right. A lady friend of mine gets French lessons for 18 pence an hour from a real French gentleman. Now you wouldn't have the face to ask me to say and teach me my own language as you would for French. So I won't give more than a shilling I can't believe it. <laughs> you know, you consider a shilling not as a simple shilling, but uh, as a percentage of this girl's income. It works out as fully equivalent to 60 or 70 guineas from a millionaire. How so? Well, figure it out. A millionaire has about 150 pounds a day. She earns about half a crown. They told you I only... Now, she offers me two-fifths of a day's income for the lesson. Two-fifths of a millionaire's income for a day would be somewhere about 60 pounds. But it's handsome. By George, it's enormous. It's the biggest offer I ever had. Sixty pounds? <laughs> what are you talking about? I never offered you sixty pounds. Where would I get... Hold your tongue. I ain't got sixty pounds. Don't cry, you foolish girl. Sit down. Nobody is going to touch your money. Somebody is going to touch you with a broomstick if you don't sit down and stop sniveling. <laughs> If I decide to teach you, I'll be worse than two fathers, do you? Here. What's this for? <laughs> to wipe your eyes. To wipe any part of your face that feels moist. Remember, that's your handkerchief and that's your sleeve. And don't mistake the one for the other if you wish to become a lady in a shop. It's no use talking to her like that, Mr. Higgins. She doesn't understand you. Besides, you're quite <coughs> wrong. She doesn't do it that way. <coughs> Here. You gave me that handkerchief. He gave it to me, not you. He did. <laughs> he did. I think it must be regarded as her property, Mrs. Pierce. Serve you right, Mr. Higgins. Higgins, I'm interested. What about the ambassador's garden party? I'll say you're the greatest teacher alive if you make that good. I'll bet you all the expenses of the experiment. You can't do it, and I'll pay for the lessons. Ah, you are real good. Thank you, Captain. <laughs> it's almost irresistible. She's so deliciously low, so horribly dirty. Oh! I'm getting dirty. I wash my face and hands before I come, or date. You're certainly not going to turn her head with flattery, Higgins. Oh, don't say that, sir. There's more ways than one of turning a girl's head, and nobody can do it better than Mr. Higgins, though he may not always mean it. I do hope, sir, that you won't encourage him to do anything foolish. And what is life but a series of inspired follies? The difficulty is to find them to do. You never lose a chance. It doesn't come every day. I shall make a duchess of this draggle-tailed gutter snipe. Ow! Yes, in six months, in three years, she has a good ear and a quick tongue. I'll take her anywhere and pass her off as anything. We start today. Now, this moment, take her away and clean her, Mrs. Pierce. Monkey friend, if it won't come off any other way. Is there a good fire in the kitchen? Yes. Uh, take all her clips off and burn them. Ring up Whiteley or somebody for new ones. Wrap her up in brown paper till they come. Yeah, no, gentlemen, you're not to speak of such things. I'm a good girl, I am, and I know what the locks of you are, I do. You want none of your listen grow prudery here, young woman. You've got to learn to behave like a duchess. Take her away, Mrs. Pierce. If she gives you any trouble, wallop her. No, I'll call the police, I will. But I've no place to put her. Put her in the dustbin. No! Come, Higgins, be reasonable. You must be reasonable, Mr. Higgins, really, you must. You can't walk over everybody like this. I? Walk over everybody? <laughs> my dear Mrs. Pierce, my dear Pickering, I never had the slightest intention of walking over anyone. 
All I propose is that we should be kind to the poor girl, and we should help her to fit and prepare herself for her new station in life. If I did not express myself clearly, it was because I did not wish to hurt her delicacy or yours. Well, did you ever hear anything like that, sir? Never, Mrs. Pierce, never. What's the matter? Well, the matter is, sir, that you can't take a girl up like that as if you were picking up a pebble on the beach. Why not? Why not? But you don't know anything about her. What about her parents? She may be married. Kian! There! <laughs> As the girl very properly says, Gan! <laughs> married indeed. Don't you know that a woman of that class looks a worn out drudge of 50 a year after she's married? Who'd marry me? By George Alexa, the streets will be strewn with the uh, bodies of men shooting themselves for your sake before I've done with you. Nonsense, sir. You <laughs> mustn't talk like that to her. Yeah, I'm going away. He's all this chump he is. I don't want no ball he's teaching me. Oh, indeed. I'm mad, am I? Very well. Mrs. Pierce, you needn't order the new clothes for her. Throw her out. No, you don't want to touch me. You see now what comes of being saucy. This way, please. I didn't want no clothes. I want a tiger. I'm buying buy my own clothes. You are an ungrateful, wicked girl. This is my return for offering to take you out of the gutter, dress you beautifully, and make a lady of you. Stop, Mr. Higgins. I won't allow it. It's you that are wicked. Go home to your parents, girl, and tell them to take better care of you. I ain't got no parents. They told me I was big enough to earn my own living, and they turned me out. Well, but where's your mother? I ain't got no mother. I they tell me I was more sick stepmother. <coughs> I come for myself. And I'm a good girl, I am. Very well, then. What on earth is all this fuss about? She's no use to anybody uh, but me. She doesn't belong to anybody. Mrs. Gibbs, uh, you can adopt her. I'm sure her daughter would be a great amusement to you. Now, don't give me any more fuss. Take it downstairs. But what should become of her? Is she to be paid anything? Would you be sensible, sir? Pay her whatever is necessary. Put it down in the housekeeping book. Why, what will she want with money? She'll have her food and her clothes. She'll only drink if you give her money. Oh, it's a lie! Nobody ever saw trying to lick her on me. Does it occur to you, Higgins, that the girl has some feelings? Oh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Not any feelings we need bother about. Have you, Eliza? I've got my feelings, same as anybody else. You see the difficulty. What difficulty? To get her to talk grammar. The mere pronunciation is easy enough. I don't want to talk, Grandma. I want to talk like a lady. Will you please keep to the point, Mr. Higgins? I want to know on what terms the girl is to be here. Is she to be, have any wages? Uh, uh, what's to become of her when you've finished your teaching? You must look ahead a little. What's to become of her if I leave her in the gutter? Tell me that, Mrs. Higgins. That's her own business, not yours, Mr. Higgins. Well, then, when I've done with her, we can throw her back into the gutter, and then it will be her own business again, so that's all right. You don't feel it all, and you. You don't care for nobody but yourself. Here, I've had enough of this. I'm going. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, you ought. Have some chocolates, Eliza. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to know what might be in them. I've heard of girls being drunk with a lot of you. Pledge of good faith, Eliza. I ate one half. Oh, mm. You eat No, no, no. You shall have boxes of them, barrels of them. Every day you should live on them, eh? Um, and you don't. <laughs> Serve the guards. 
with a beautiful moustache. The son of a marquis who would disinherit him for having married you, but what a man do you see is your beauty and your goodness. Excuse me, Higgins, but I really must interfere. Mrs. Pierce is quite right. If this girl is to put herself in your hands for six months for an experiment in teaching, she must understand thoroughly what she's doing. Well, how can she? She's incapable of understanding anything. And besides, do any of us understand what we are doing? And if we did, would we ever do it? <laughs> Very clever, Higgins, but not sound sense. Miss Doolittle, I think... Uh, there, that's all you'll get out of the life, sir. <laughs> explaining to her as a military man you want to know that give her her orders that's what she wants eliza you are to live here for the next six months learning how to speak beautifully like a lady in a florist shop if you're good and do whatever you're told you shall sleep in a proper bedroom and have plenty to eat and have money to buy chocolates and take rides and taxis if you're naughty and idle you shall sleep in the back kitchen among the black beetles and be one-upped by mrs pierce with a broomstick <laughs> At the end of six months, you shall go to Buckingham Palace in a carriage, beautifully dressed. If the king finds out you're not a lady, you shall be taken by the police to the Tower of London, where your head will be cut off as a warning to other presumptuous nowadays. If you're not found out, you shall have a present of seven and sixpence to start life with as a lady in the shop. If you refuse this offer, you shall be a most ungrateful and wicked girl, and the angel shall be for you. Now, are you satisfied, Pinker? Could I put it more fairly and plainly, Mrs. Pierce? I think perhaps you'd better let me talk to the girl properly in private. I don't know that I can take charge of her or consent to the arrangement at all. Of course, I know you don't mean her any harm, but when you get what you call interested in people's accents, you never think or care what may happen to them or you. Come with me, Eliza. That's all right, Mrs. Pierce. Thank you. Take her away to the bathroom. You're a great bully, you are. Well, I won't stay here if I don't lie. And I won't be walloped. And if I have to go to Buckingham Palace, I did it. I'll never be in trouble with the police, not me. I'm a good girl. Don't answer back, Eliza. You don't understand the government. Come with me. Oh, I know what's right. I won't go near the king if I'm to have my head cut off. <laughs> If I know I was letting myself in for, I never would have come here. I've always been a good girl. I never offered to speak to him. I don't owe him nothing. And I don't care. And I got my feelings the same as anybody else. Ow! Excuse the uh, strange question, Higgins, but are you a man of good character where women are concerned? Have you ever met a man? <laughs> yes, very frequently. Well, I haven't. I find that the moment I let a woman make friends with me, she becomes jealous, exacting, suspicious, and a damn nuisance. I find that the moment I allow myself to make friends with a woman, I become selfish and tyrannical. Now, women upset everything. When you let them into your life, you find that the woman's driving at one thing and you're driving at another. And what, for example? Oh, Lord knows. I suppose the woman wants to live her own life and the man wants to live his but they each try to drag each other onto the wrong track. One wants to go north, the other south, and the result is they both have to go east, though they both hit the east wind. <laughs> so, here I am, a confirmed old bachelor, and likely to remain so. Oh, come, Higgins, you know what I mean. If I'm to be in this business, I should feel responsible for that girl. I hope it's understood that no advantage is to be taken of her position. What? That thing? Sacred, I assure you. You see, she would be a pupil. And teaching would be impossible unless pupils were sacred. Well, I've taught scores of American millionaires how to speak English. The best looking women in the world. I'm seasoned. They might just be a block of wood. I might as well be a block of wood. Oh! Well, Mrs. Pierce, is it all right? I just wish to trouble you with a word, if I may, Mr. Pierce. Yes, certainly. Come in. Oh, don't burn that, Mrs. Pierce. I'll keep that. As a curiosity. Uh, have you kept it, sir, please? <laughs> I, I had promised her not to burn it, but I had better put it in the oven for a while. Oh, no. thank you. <laughs> well, what have you to say to me? Am I the way? Not at all, sir. Mr. Higgins, will you please be very particular what you say before the girl? Well, of course. I'm always particular about what I say. Why do you say this to me? No, sir. 
dare you come here and attempt to blackmail me? You sent her here on purpose. No, Governor. You must have. How else would you have known that she was here? Oh, don't take a man like that, Governor. The police shall take you up. This is a plot. A plot to extort money by threats. I shall telephone for the police. Can I ask you for a brass barbing? I'll, I'll leave it to the gentleman here if I said a word about money. But what else did you come for? Well, what would a man come for? Be you, Governor. Alfred, did you put her up to it? So help me, Governor, I never did. I ain't seen the girl these two months past. How did you know she was here? Well, I'll tell you if you only let me get a word in. I'm willing to tell you, I'm wanting to tell you, I'm waiting to tell you. Pickering, <laughs> this chap has a certain native gift for rhetoric. Observe the rhythm of his native wood notes wild. I'm willing to tell you, I'm wanting to tell you, I'm waiting to tell you. Sentimental rhetoric. That's the Welsh strain in him. It also accounts for his mendacity and dishonesty. Oi! <laughs> Please, Higgins, I'm West Country myself. How did you know the girl was here if you didn't say? It was not this, Governor. The girl took a boy in a taxi to give him a job. Son of a landlady he is. He hung about on the chance of her giving him another ride out. Well, she sent him back for her luggage when she heard he was willing for her to stop here. One at the board corner of Longacre and Endell Street. Public house, yes? Poor man's club, Governor. Why shouldn't I? Do let him tell his story, Higgins. He told me what was up. Now I ask you, what was my feelings and my duty as a father? I says to the boy, you bring me the luggage, I says. Why didn't you go for it yourself? Landlady wouldn't have trusted me with it. She's that kind of woman now. I'd give the boy a penny before he trusted me with it, the little swine. I brought it to her just to oblige you like and make myself agreeable, that's all. How much luggage? A uh, musical instrument, Governor, a few pictures, a trifle of jewellery and a birdcage. She said she didn't want no clothes. What was I to think from that? I ask you as a parent, what was I to think? So you came to rescue her from worse than death. Oh, right? just so, Governor, that's right. Uh, well, why did you bring her luggage if you intended to take her away? Why well, said a word about taking her away, have I now? You are going to take her away, double quick. No, Governor, don't say that. I'm not the man to stand in my girl's life. Here's a career opening for her, as you might say. This is Eliza's father. He has come to take her away. Give her to me. This is a misunderstanding. You can't me. take her away, Mr. Higgins. How can you? You told me to burn her clothes. That's right. I can't carry the girl for the streets like a blooming monkey, can I? I put it to you. You have put it to me that you want your daughter. Take your daughter. If she has no clothes, go out and buy her some. Well, where's the clothes she come in? Did I burn them or did your missus here? If you please, I am the housekeeper. I have sent for some clothes for your girl. When they come, you can... Take her away. You can wait in the kitchen. This way, please. Listen here, Governor. You and me's men of the world, ain't we? Oh, men of the world, are we? You'd better go, Mrs. Yes. I think so, indeed, sir. The uh, floor is yours, Mr. Oh. Middle. Oh, thank you, Governor. Well, the truth is, I'm taking a sort of fancy to you, Governor. If you want to go, I'm so set on having a back home again, but I might be able to arrangement. Now, regarding the life of a young woman, she's a fine, handsome girl. But as a daughter, she's not worth a keep. But so I tell you straight, all I ask is my rights as a father, and you're the last man alive to expect me to let her go for nothing. For I can see you're one of the straight sort, Governor. Well, what's a five-pound note to you? And what's Eliza to me? I think you ought to know, Doolittle, that Mr. Higgins' intentions are entirely honoured. Well, of course they are. If I thought there was an I'd ask fifty. <laughs> <laughs> Do you mean to say, you Alice Rascal, that you'd sell your daughter for fifty pounds? In a general way, I wouldn't, but to oblige a gentleman like you, I'd do a good deal, I do assure you. Have you no morals, man? No, oh, can't afford them, Governor. <laughs> <laughs> Neither could you if you was as poor as me. Not that I mean any harm, but if Liza's gonna have a bit out of this, why not me too? <laughs> I don't know what to do, Pickering. There can be no question that, as a matter of morals, it would be a positive crime to give this chap a farthing, and yet I feel a sort of rough justice in his claim. Well, that's it, Governor. That's all I say. A father's are, as it were. Well, I know the feeling, but really, it seems hardly right to... Oh, oh don't say that, Governor. Don't get it that way. Why am I, Governor's bad? Why ask you what am I? I'm one of the undeserving poor. That's why I am. Think of what that means to a man. It means he's up again middle-class morality all the time. Going and offering for a bit of it, it's always the same story. Oh, you're undeserving, so you can't have it. 
Well, my niece is as great as the most deserving widow that's got money out of six different charities in one week for the death of the same husband. <laughs> I don't need less than a deserving man. I need more. I don't eat less than him, and I drink a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> I want a bit of amusement, because I'm a thinking. I want cheerfulness and a song and a band when I feel low. Well, they charge me the same for everything as they charge the deserving. What is middle class morality? It's just an excuse for never giving me anything. Therefore, I ask you as two gentlemen not to play that game on me. I'm playing straight with you. I ain't pretending to be deserving. I'm undeserving. And I mean to go on being undeserving. I like it. That's what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Are you take advantage of a man's nature and do it out the price of his own daughter ways. Brought up and fed and clothed by the sweat of his brow so she's grown big enough to be interested to you two gentlemen? Is the five pounds unreasonable? I put it to you and I leave it to you. <laughs> Pickard, if we were to take this man in hand for three months, he could choose between a seat in the cabinet and a popular pulpit in Wales. <laughs> What do you say to that, Doolittle? Not me, thank you kindly, Governor. I've heard all the preachers and all the Prime Ministers. I'm a thinking man, game for politics and religion and social reform, same as all the other amusements. And I tell you, it's a dog's life any way you look at it. Undeserving poverty is my line. Taking one station in society with another, it's, well, it's the only one with any ginger in it, to my taste. <laughs> I suppose we must give him a fiver. He'll make a bad use of it, I'm afraid. Oh, not me, Governor, so help me, I won't. Don't be afraid that I'll save it, or spare it, or live idle on it. There won't be a penny of it left on Monday. <laughs> 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 I'll have to go to work, same as if I never had it. It won't pauperise me. Just one good spree for myself and the missus, giving pleasure to ourselves, employment to others, and satisfaction to you to know that it hasn't been thrown away. Who's been that? This is irresistible. Let's give him ten. <laughs> no, no, no. no. She wouldn't have the art to spend ten, and perhaps I shouldn't neither. Ten pounds is a lot of money. Makes a man feel prudent like, then it's good by the happiness. <laughs> when I ask you, Governor, not a penny more, not a penny less. Why don't you marry that missus of yours? I rather draw the line at encouraging that sort of immorality. Tell her so, Governor, tell her so. I'm willing. Me that suffers by it. I've no old honour. Got to be agreeable to her. Got to buy her presents. I want to give her clothes, something sinful. I'm a state of that woman, Governor, just because I'm not a lawful husband, and she knows it too. <laughs> Catch her marrying me. In my advice, Governor, marry Eliza while she's young and don't know no better. If you don't, you'll be sorry for it after. <laughs> if you do, she'll be sorry for it after. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're a man and she's only a woman and don't know how to be happy in the house. if we were to listen to this man another minute, we shall have no convictions left. Five pounds, I think. Thank you kindly, Governor. Are you sure you won't take time? I'm not now. No time, Governor. There you are. <laughs> Thank you, Governor. Good morning. Oh, beg pardon, miss. John, don't you know your own daughter? Why, Joe? Don't I look silly? Silly? No, sir. Please, don't say anything to make the girl conceited about herself. Uh, quite right, Mrs. Pierce. Uh, yes, damn silly. Please, sir. Oh, excuse me. Um, Extremely silly. Oh, I shouldn't have gone right with my hat on. A <laughs> new fashion by George. That also look horrible. Well, I never thought she'd clean up as good looking as that, Governor. She's a credit to me, ain't she? I tell you, cleaning up's easy here. Or in cold water on tap as much as you like there is. Well, these towels there is. The towel is so hot and burns your fingers. Soft brushes. Scrub yourself, and a wooden bowl of soap smelling like primroses. Now I know why ladies are so clean. Wash is a treat for them. Wish they saw what it was the love of me. I'm glad the bathroom met with your approval. It did. Not all of it. I don't care as me say it, Mrs. Pierce knows. What was wrong, Mrs. Pierce? Oh, nothing, sir. It doesn't matter. I had up my mind to break it. I didn't know which way to look. I'm going to tell over it, I did. Over what? Over the looking glass, sir. Doolittle, you have brought up your daughter too strictly. Me? I never brought her up at all, except to give her a lick of a strap now and again. <laughs> Don't put it on me, Governor. She ain't accustomed to it, you see, that's all. 
She'll soon pick up your free and easy ways. I'm a good girl, I am, and won't pick up no free and easy ways. Eliza, if you say again that you're a good girl, your father shall take you home. Not in. You don't know my father. You only come here to touch it for some money to get drunk on. What else would I want money for? <laughs> to put in the pit in church, I suppose. Don't you dare you me! Don't let me hear you giving this gentleman any of a nod, or you're away from me about it, see? Have you any further advice to give her before you go, Jupiter? Your blessing, for instance? No, Governor. My intention of mother's put my children to all I know myself. Hard enough to own them in without that, eh? When Elijah's mind improved, Governor, you do it yourself of a strap. So long, gentlemen. Stop. You shall visit your daughter regularly. It's your duty, you know. My brother is a clergyman. He could help you in your talks. Oh, certainly I'll come, Governor. Not just this week, I have a job at a distance. But later on, you may depend on me. Afternoon, gentlemen. Afternoon, <laughs> Mum. <laughs> Don't you believe the old liar? He'd have seen you set a bulldog on him as a clergyman. You won't see him again in a hurry. I don't want to, Eliza. Do you? No. I don't never want to see him again, or don't. He's a disgrace to me, he is. Collecting dust instead of working out his trade. Well, what is his trade, Eliza? Talking money out of other people's pockets into his own. <laughs> it's proper trade than I've been. He works at it sometimes, too. For exercise. And he makes good money at it. Ain't you going to call me Miss Doolittle anymore? Oh, I beg your pardon, Miss Doolittle. It was a slip of the tongue. I don't mind. Only it sounded so genteel. I should just not take a taxi in the corner of Tottenham Court Road and get out there and tell it to wait for me. Just to put the girls in their place a bit, I should speak to them, you know. Better wait till we get you something that's really fashionable. Besides, you shouldn't cut your old friends now that you've risen in the world. That's what we call snobbery. What do you call the love of them, my friends, now, I should hope? Took it out of me often enough every time they had a chance with their ridicule, and I mean to have a bit of my own back. But if I'm to have fashionable clothes, I'm white. <laughs> I should not do have some. Mrs. Pierce says you're going to give me something to wear bed at night, different to what I wear during the daytime. But I do seem a waste of money when you can buy something to show. <laughs> Besides, I never could fancy to change it to call things on a wet night. Now, Eliza, the new things have come for you to try off. Ah! Something is like. 
like you. Uh, <laughs> I shall never get in the way of seriously liking young women. Some habits lie too deep to be changed. And besides, Do you know what you would do if you really laughed at me, Henry? Well, bother what? Mary, I suppose. No, stop fidgeting and take your hands out of your pockets. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good boy. Now tell me about the girl. Oh, she's coming to see you. I don't remember asking her. Uh, you didn't. I asked her. If you didn't own her, you wouldn't have asked her. Indeed. Why? Well, you see, it's like this. She's a common flower girl. I picked her off the curb step. And asked her to my home? Oh, that'll be all right. I taught her to speak properly, and she has strict orders as to her behavior. Oh. She's to keep to two subjects, the weather and everyone's health. Fine day and how do you do and all that, you know, and not to let herself go on things in general. So that will be safe. Safe to talk about our health, about our insides. Oh, perhaps about our outsides. How could you be so silly, Henry? Well, she must talk about something. Oh, she'll be all right, don't you fuss. Pickering's in it with me. I've sort of a bet on that I could pass her off as a duchess in six months. I started on her some months ago, and she's getting on like a house on fire. Uh, I shall win my bet. She's a quick year. And she's been easier to teach than my middle class pupils because she's had to learn a complete new language. She speaks English almost as you talk French. Well, that's satisfactory to all of it. Well, it is, and it isn't. What does that mean? You see, I've got her pronunciation all right, but you have to consider not only what a girl pronounces, but how she pronounces it, and that's where I've got a problem. Mrs. and Miss Ainsford Hill. Oh, Lord. <laughs> how do you do? do? How do you do? My son, Henry. Oh, your celebrated son. I've so long to meet you, Professor Higgins. Delighted. How do you do? Oh, I've seen you before somewhere. I haven't the ghost of an ocean where, but I've heard your voice. So you better sit down. <laughs> I'm sorry to say that my celebrated son has no manners. You mustn't find him. I don't. Oh, not at all. Oh, look, have I been rude? I didn't mean to be. Colonel Pickering. Oh. How do you do, Mrs. Higgins? So glad you've come. Do you know Mrs. Einsford Hill? Oh. Miss Einsford Hill? Has Henry told you what we've come for? We were interrupted, damn it. Henry, really? Uh, are we in the way? No, no. You couldn't have come more fortunately. We want you to be a friend of ours. Yes, by George. We want two or three people, and you'll do as well as anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Einsford Hill. Out of heaven, another one. How do you do? Very good of you to come. How uh, do you do? I don't think you know my son, Professor Higgins. How do you do? I'll take my oath I've seen you before somewhere. Where was it? Uh, I don't think so. Oh, it doesn't matter. You don't see <laughs> Well, here we are, anyhow. <laughs> oh, and now what the devil are we to talk about until the lives Mr. Higgins? Mr. Higgins? Oh, 
Higgins told me I might come. Quite right. I'm very glad indeed to see you. Uh, how do you do, Miss Doolittle? Colonel Pickering, is it not? I feel sure we have met before, Miss Doolittle. I remember your eyes. How do you do? <laughs> oh, my daughter, Clara. How do you do? <laughs> how do you do? I've certainly had the pleasure. My son, Freddy. How <laughs> do you do? <laughs> By George, yes, it all comes back to me now. Come and come.
my mother used to give him four pence and send him out to let him not come back until he drunk himself cheerful and loving like. Lots of women have to make their husbands drunk to make them fit to live with. <laughs> Which is improper. No, dearest, it would be quite proper, say, 
or a canal ball. Mm. <laughs> but it would not be proper for her at a garden party. Oh, well, I but come, see. Higgins, come. You must learn to know yourself. I haven't heard such language as yours since we used to review the volunteers in Hyde Park 20 years ago. Well, well if you say so. I suppose I don't always talk like a bishop. Colonel Pickering, will you tell me what is the exact state of things in Windhoek Street? Well, I have come to live there with Henry. We work together at my Indian dialects, and we think it more convenient if Quite I stay so. there. I, I know all about this. It's an excellent arrangement. But where does this girl live? With us, of course. Where would she live? But on what terms? Is she a servant? If not, what is she? Uh, I think I know what you mean, Mrs. Higgins. Well, dash me if I do. I've had to work at the girl every day for months to get her to her present pitch. And besides, she's useful. She knows where my things are and uh, remembers my appointments for me and so forth. How does your housekeeper get on with her? Mrs. Fears? Oh, she's jolly glad to have so much taken off her hands. For before Eliza came, she used to have to find things and remember my appointments. <laughs> but she's got some silly bee in her bonnet about Eliza. She keeps saying... You don't think so, doesn't she? Yes, that's the formula. You don't think so. That's the end of every conversation about your life. If I ever stop thinking about the girl and her bloody consonants and vowels, <laughs> I'm worn out thinking about them and watching her teeth and her tongue and her lips, not to mention her soul, which is the quaintest of the lot. You certainly are a pretty pair of babies playing with your live doll. Playing? The hardest job I've ever tackled. Make no mistake about that, man. No idea how frightfully interesting it is and to take a human being and turn her into quite a different human being by creating a new speech for her. It's filling up the deepest gulf that separates class from class and soul from soul. Yes, it's extremely interesting. I assure you, my dear Mrs. Higgins, we take Eliza very seriously. Mm. Every week, every day almost, there is some new change. We keep records of every stage, dozens of gramophone discs and photographs. Yes, by George, it's the most absorbing experiment I've ever tackled. Oh. She regularly fills our lives up, doesn't she? Oh, we're always talking Eliza. Teaching Eliza. Dressing Eliza. What? Inventing new Eliza. Oh, I assure you, She's my dear, she's a genius. Why, she did play the piano quite beautifully. I've tried her with the we most extraordinary sounds of the human all being all the same thing. She plays everything she gets right off the moment she comes home. Whether it's Beto in Brahms, a large while of Even though six months ago, she never saw where she touched the piano. Oh, I beg your pardon. Sorry. When Vivian starts shouting, nobody can get a word in its way. Colonel Pickering, don't you realize that when Eliza walked into Wimpole Street, something walked in with her? Her father did, but Henry soon got rid of him. <laughs> it would have been more to the point if her mother had, but as her mother didn't, something else did. But what? A problem. Oh, I see the problem of how to pass her off as a lady. No, I'll solve that problem. I've had solved it already. No, you two infinitely stupid male creatures. <laughs> <laughs> the problem of what is to be done with her afterwards. But I don't see anything in that. She can go her own way with all the advantages I've given her. Advantages? Oh, that poor woman who was here just now. The manners and habits that disqualify a fine lady from earning her own living without giving her a fine lady's income. Is that what you mean? Oh, that will be all right, Mrs. Higgins. We'll find her some light employment. She's happy enough. Don't you worry about her. Goodbye. Anyhow, there's no good bothering now. The thing's done. Goodbye, Mother. Uh, there are plenty of openings. We'll do what's right. Goodbye. Let's take it to the Shakespeare exhibition at Earl's Court. Yes, let's. Her remarks will be delicious. <laughs> She'll mimic all the people for us when we get out. Ripping. <laughs> <laughs>
this is a fearful row if we leave these things lying about in the drawing room. Oh, chuck them over the balusters ah. into the hall. She'll find them there in the morning and put them away, all right? <laughs> She'll think we were drunk. We are, uh, slightly. Uh, are there any letters? I didn't look. circulars and this coronated billet doux for you. Ha! Uh, 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 oh, what an evening. What a crew. <laughs> what a silly Tom Foodery. Oh, they're there, are they? Well, I feel a bit tired. It's been a long day. A garden party, a dinner party, and the opera. Hey, rather too much of a good thing. You've won your bet, Higgins. Eliza did the trick in something to spare, eh? Thank God, God that's over. Were you nervous at the garden party? I was. Eliza didn't seem a bit nervous. No, she wasn't nervous. No, I knew she'd be all right. No, it's the strain of putting the job through all these months that's told on me. No, it was interesting enough at first while we were at the phonetics, but after that I got deadly sick of it. If I hadn't backed myself to do it, I should have chucked the whole thing up two months ago. It was a silly notion. The whole thing has been a bore. Oh, come! The garden party was frightfully exciting. My heart began beating like anything. Yes, for the first three minutes. But when I saw we were going to win hands down, <laughs> I felt like a bear in a cage, hanging about doing nothing. The dinner was worse. Sitting there gorging for over an hour with nothing but a damn fool of a fashionable woman to talk to. I tell you, Pickering, never again for me. No more artificial duchesses. The whole thing has been simple purgatory. You've never been broken in properly to the social routine. I rather enjoy it. Dipping into it occasionally myself makes me feel young again. Anyhow, it was a great success, an immense success. <laughs> I was quite frightened once or twice because Eliza was doing it so well. You see, lots of the real people can't do it at all. <laughs> They're such fools that they think style comes by nature to people in their position. Yes. And so they never learn. Uh, there's always something professional about doing a thing superlatively well. Yes, that's what drives me mad. The silly people don't know their own silly business. However, that's over and done with, and now I can go to bed at last without dreading tomorrow. I think I shall turn in too. Still, it's been a great occasion, a triumph for you. Good night. Good night. Uh, put out the lights, Eliza, and uh, tell Mrs. Pierce not to make coffee for me in the morning. I'll take tea. Insect, I won it. What did you throw those slippers at me for? Because I wanted to smash your face. I could kill you, selfish brute. Why did you leave me where you picked me 
down top. In the gutter. You think going up's all over? That you could throw me back there again, do you? <laughs> the creature is nervous after all. Ah, would you? Claws in, you cat. How dare you show your temper to me? Sit down. Be quiet. What's to become of me? What's to become of me? How the devil do I know what's to become of you? What does it matter what becomes of you? You don't care. I know you don't care. You wouldn't care if I was dead. I'm nothing to you, not as much as those slippers. Those slippers? <laughs> those slippers. I didn't think it made any difference now. Why have you begun going on like this? May I ask whether you uh, complain of your treatment here? No. Has anybody behaved badly to you? <clears throat> Colonel Pickering, Mrs. Pierce, any of the servants? No. I don't presume that you pretend that I have treated you badly. No. I'm glad to hear it. Perhaps you're tired from the strain of the day. Will you have a glass of champagne? No! Thank you. But this has been coming on you for some days. I suppose it was only natural for you to be anxious about the garden party, but that's all over now. There's nothing more to worry about. No. Nothing more for you to worry about. Oh God, I wish I was dead. Why? In heaven's name, why? Listen to me, Eliza. All this irritation is purely subjective. I don't understand. It's only, I'm too ignorant. It's only imagination. No spirits and nothing more. Nobody's hurting you, nothing's wrong. Now you go to bed like a good girl and sleep it off. Have a good cry and then say your prayers. That will make you comfortable. I heard your prayers. Thank God it's all over. Well, don't you thank God it's all over? Now you're free and you can do what you like. What am I fit for? What have you left me fit for? Where am I to go? What am I to do? What's to become of me? Yeah. That's what's worrying you, isn't it? But I shouldn't bother about it if I were you. I should imagine you won't have any difficulty settling yourself somewhere. Uh, I haven't quite realized you were going away. human relations by dragging all this cat about buying and selling into it. You needn't marry the fellow if you don't like him. What else am I to do? Oh, lots of things. What about your old idea of a flower shop? Pickering could set you up in one. He's lots of money. <laughs> They'll have to pay for all those togs you've been wearing today. And that, with the hire of the jewelry, will make a big hole in 200 pounds. Why, six months ago, you would have thought of a millennium to have a flower shop of your own. Come, you'll be all right. Now, I 
I must clear off to bed. I'm devilish sleepy. By the way, I came down for something, but I forget what it was. Your slippers. Oh, yes, of course. You shied them at me. <laughs> Where you go, sir? There. Do my clothes belong to me or to Colonel Pickering? <laughs> what the devil use would they be to Pickering? He might want them for the next guy you pick up to experiment on. Is that the way you feel towards us? I don't want to hear any more about that now. I just want to know what belongs to me. My own clothes were burnt. What does that matter? Why need you to start bothering about that in the middle of the night? I just want to know what I may take away with me. I don't want to be accused of stealing. Stealing? You shouldn't have said that, Eliza. That shows a want of feeling. I'm sorry. I'm only a common, ignorant girl in my station. I have to be careful. There can't be any feeling between the like of you and the like of me. So please, will you just tell me what belongs to me and what doesn't? You may take that whole damn house full, if you like. Except the jewels, they're hired. Will that satisfy you? Stop, please. Will you take these to your room and keep them safe? I don't want to run the risk of their being missing. Hand them over. If these belong to me instead of to the jewelers, I'd ram them down your ungrateful throat. This ring isn't the jewelers. You bought it for me in Brighton. I don't want it now. From the street shop. How could you accuse me of these things? It is you who have hurt me. You have wounded me to the heart. I'm glad. I got a bit of my own back anyhow. You have caused me to lose my temper, a thing that has hardly ever happened to me. I prefer to say nothing more tonight. I'm going to bed. You want to leave a note from Mrs. Pierce for the coffee? Well, she won't be told by me. Damn Mrs. Pierce, and damn the coffee, and damn you! And damn my own folly for having lavished my hard-earned knowledge and the treasure of my regard and intimacy on a heartless, goodless knife! is downstairs with Colonel Pickering. Well, I'll shoot them off. They're using the telephone, Mum. 
telephoning to the police, I think. What? Mr. Henry is in a state, Mum. If you had told me that Mr. Henry was not in a state, it would have been a surprise. <laughs> Tell them to come up when they've finished with the police. I suppose he's lost or something. Yes, Mum. Go upstairs and tell Miss Doolittle that Mr. Henry and the Colonel are here. Ask her not to come down till I send for her. Yes, Mum. Here's a confounded thing. Oh, yes, dear. Good morning. <laughs> what is it? Eliza's boot. Oh, you must have frightened her. Frightened her? Nonsense. She was left last night, as usual, to put out the lights and all that. And instead of going to bed, she changed her clothes and went right off. Her bed wasn't slept in. She came in a cab for her things before seven this morning, and that poor Mrs. Spears gave them to her without saying a word to me about it. What am I to do? Do without, I'm afraid, Henry. Girl has a perfect right to leave if she chooses. But I can't find anything, and I don't know what appointments I've got. And good morning, Mrs. Eames. Has Henry told you? What does that hospital <laughs> inspector say? Well, have you offered a reward? You don't mean to say that you have set the police after Eliza? Of course. What are the police for? <laughs> what else can I do? Uh, the inspector made a lot of difficulties. I really think he suspected us of some improper purpose. Well, of course he did. What right have you to go to the police and give the girl's name as if she were a thief or a lost umbrella or something, really? We want to find her. We can't let her go like this, you know, Mrs. Higgins, and what are we to do? You have no more sense, either of you, than two children. <clears throat> Mr. Henry, a gentleman wants to see you very particular. He's been sent on from Wimpole Street. Father, I can't see anyone now. Who is it? A hey, Mr. Doolittle, sir. Doolittle? Do you mean the dustman? Dustman? Oh, no, sir. A gentleman. Why, George, it's some relative of hers that she's gone to. Somebody we know nothing about. Send him up, quick. Yes, sir. Genteel relatives. Now we shall hear something. Do you know any other people? Only her father, the fellow we told you about. Mr. Doolittle. Well, <laughs> see you. You see this? You've done this. Done what, man? This, I tell you! Look at it! Look at this hat! Look at this coat! Has Eliza been buying you clothes? Eliza, <laughs> not she, not... Why would she buy me clothes? Good morning, Mr. Dillard. So won't you sit down? No, oh, asking your pardon, Mum. Thank you. I am that full of what has happened to me that I can't think of anything else. What the dickens has happened to you? I shouldn't mind if it only happened to me. I mean, anything might happen to anybody. Nobody to blame but Providence, as you might say. But this is something you've done. Yes, you and me. Yes. Have you found Eliza? That's the point. Have you lost her? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Blimey, you have all the luck you have. I am going to still find me quick enough after what you've done to me. But what has my son done to you, Mr. Doolittle? Done to me? Ruined me? Destroyed my happiness? Tied me up and delivered me in the hands of middle class morality? <laughs> <laughs> you're not raving! You're drunk! You're mad! I gave you five pounds. After that, I had two conversations with you at half a crown an hour. I haven't seen you since. Oh, drunk, am I? Mad, am I? Tell me this. Did you or did you not write a letter to an old blighter in America who was giving away five millions to found moral reform societies all over the world and wanted you to invent a universal language for him? What? Ezra D. Wanapella? Uh, he's dead. Yes, he's dead, and I'm done for. Now, did you or did you not write to him to say that the most original moralist at present in England, to the best of your knowledge, was Alfred Doolittle, a common dustman? <laughs> well, I have to ask, I do remember some making some little <laughs> joke. <laughs> you may well call it a little joke, but it put the lid on me right enough. Just give him the time to show that Americans, it's not like us, that they recognise and respect merit in every class of life of ever rumble. Them words is in his blooming will, Henry Higgins, in which he leaves me a share in his pre-digested cheese trust worth three thousand a year, <laughs> on condition that I lecture for his one fellow moral reform world league as often as they ask me, up to six times a year. <laughs> the devil! <laughs> <it hurts. laughs> what a lot! Uh, it's a safe thing for you, Doolittle. Uh, they won't ask you twice. Take <laughs> <laughs> the lecture in our mind. I'll lecture them blue in the face, I will, and not turn it out. Making a gentleman of me that I object to. Who asked him to make a gentleman of me, eh? I was happy. I was free. I touched 
praying to everybody for money when I wanted to, same as I touched you, Henry Higgins. Now I'm warranted. Tied neck and heels and everybody touches me for money. <laughs> oh, it's a fine thing for you, says my solicitor. Oh, is it, says I. I mean, it's a good thing for you, I says. When I was a poor man, had a solicitor once when they found a pram in the dust cart, he got me off, got shut of me, and got me shut of him quick as he could. Same with doctors. He used to shut me out the hospital before I could barely stand on my legs, and nothing to pay. Now they find out I'm not a healthy man. They can't live unless they look after me twice a day. <laughs> <laughs> in my own house, I'm not allowed to do a hand's turn for myself. Somebody else must do it and touch me for it. <laughs> last year, oh, last year I had a relative in the world, except well, two or three that wouldn't speak to me. Now I'm 50 and not a decent week's wages among the lot of them. I have to live for others and not myself. That's middle class morality. You talk of losing Eliza, don't you be anxious. I bet she's on my doorstep by this. Heard it could support herself easy by selling flowers if I wasn't respectable. And the next one to touch me will be you, Henry Higgins. I'll have to learn to speak your middle class language from you instead of speaking proper English. That's where you'll come in and I dare say that's what you've done it for. But my dear Mr. Doolittle, you need not suffer all this if you are really in earnest. Nobody can force you to accept this request. You can repudiate it. Isn't that so, Colonel Pickering? I believe so, yes. That's the tragedy of it, Mum. It's easy to say chuck it, but I have the nerve. Which of us has? What is there for me if I chuck it in my old age but the workhouse? Already at the time I had to keep my job as a dustman. Now, if I was one of the deserving for it, but buy a bit, then I could chuck it. Then why should I? Because the deserving for my as we millionaires from the happiness they ever has. They don't know what happiness is. <laughs> no, I... It's one of the undeserving poor. I have nothing between me and the pauper's uniform and does he have blasted 3,000 a year that shoves me into the middle class. <laughs> oh, excuse the expression, Mum. You'd use it yourself if you had my provocation. <laughs> <laughs> they get you everywhere you turn. Whether it's silly in a workhouse or a char, but it's in the middle class. And I have the nerve for the workhouse. Intimidated, that's why I am. Broke. Bought up. Happy and men than me will call for my dust and touch me for their tip. And I'll look on helpless and envy them. And that's what your son has brought me to. Well, I'm very glad you're not going to do anything foolish, Mr. Doolittle. But this solves the problem of Eliza's future. You can provide for her now. Oh, uh, yes, Mum. I'm expected to provide for everyone now out of 3,000 a year. <laughs> Nonsense. He can't provide for her. He shan't provide for her. She doesn't belong to him. I paid him five pounds. <laughs> Do they tell you either you're an honest man or a rogue? Little of both, Henry. Like the rest of us, a little of both. <laughs> <laughs> you took that money for the girl, and you have no right to take her as well. Henry, don't be absurd. If you want to know where Eliza is, she's upstairs. What? Upstairs? Well, then I shall jolly soon fetch her down. Be quiet, Henry. Sit down. I am Sit going... Sit down here. <laughs> Very well, very well. But I think you might have told us this half an hour ago. <laughs> Eliza came to me this morning. She passed the night partly walking about in a rage, partly trying to throw herself into the river and being afraid to, and partly in the Carlton Hotel. She told me of the brutal way you two treated her. What? My dear Mrs. Higgins, she's been telling you stories. We didn't treat her brutally. We hardly said a word to her. <laughs> and we parted on particularly good terms. Higgins, did you bully her after I went to bed? Just the other way about. She threw my slippers in my face. Uh, behaved in the most outrageous fashion. I never gave her the slightest provocation. The slippers came banging into my face the moment I entered the room before I had uttered a word. And used perfectly awful language. But why? What did we do to her? I think I know pretty well what you did. The girl is naturally rather affectionate, I think, isn't she, Mr. Doolittle? Oh, very tender of it, Mum. Thanks after me. <laughs> Just <a serve. laughs> she had become attached to you both. She worked very hard for you, Henry. I don't think you quite realize what anything in the nature of brain work means to a girl like that. Well, it seems that when the great day of trial came and she did this wonderful thing for you without making a single mistake, you two sat there and never said a word to her, but talked together of how glad you were that it was all over and how you had been bored with the whole thing. And then you were surprised because she threw your slippers at you. I should have thrown the fire irons at you. <laughs> 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 Listen, 
said nothing except that we were tired and wanted to go to bed, did we? Did that was all. Oh, quite sure. Absolutely, really, that was all. You didn't thank her or pet her or admire her or tell her how splendid she'd be. Oh, but she knew all about that. We didn't make speeches to her, that's what you mean. Uh, perhaps we were a little inconsiderate. Uh, is she very angry? Well, I'm afraid she won't go back to Wimpole Street, especially now that Mr. Doolittle was able to provide in such a way that you are thrust upon her. Bloody <laughs> <laughs> But she says she is quite willing to meet you on friendly terms and to let bygones be bygones. Oh, is she by George? <laughs> if you promise to behave yourself, Henry, I'll ask her to, to come down. If not, go home. But you have taken up quite another lie tonight. <laughs> All right. Very well. Vic, you better behave yourself. <laughs> Let us put on our best Sunday manners for this creature that we picked out of the mud. Now, now, Henry Higgins, have some consideration for my feelings as a middle class man. <laughs> Remember your promise, Henry. <laughs> Mr. Jubitel, will you be so good as to step out on the balcony for a moment? I don't want Eliza to have the shock of your news until she's made it up with these two gentlemen, would you mind? As you wish, lady. Anything to help Henry to keep her off mine. <laughs> Ask Miss Doolittle to come down, please. Yes, Mum. <laughs> <laughs> What the devil is that girl? Are we to wait here all day? How do you do, Professor Higgins? Are you quite well? Um, I... But of course you are. You are never ill. So good to see you again, Colonel Pickering. Quite chilly this morning, isn't it? Yes. Don't you dare try this game on me. I taught it to you, and it doesn't take me in. Now get up and come home. And don't be a fool. Very nice put indeed, Henry. No woman could resist such an invitation. <laughs> <laughs> you let her alone, Mother. Let her speak for herself, and you shall jolly soon see whether she has an idea that I haven't put in her head, or a word I haven't put in her mouth. I tell you, I have created this thing from the squashed cabbage leaves of Covent Garden, and now she pretends to play the fine lady with me. Yes, dear, but you'll sit down. <laughs> Will you drop me altogether now that the experiment is over, Colonel Pickering? Oh, don't. Uh, you, you mustn't think of it as, as an experiment. It shocks me somehow. Oh, but I am only a squashed cabbage leaf. No, no. <laughs> but I owe you so much that I should be very happy if you forgot me. It's very kind of you to say so, Mr. It's not because you paid for my dresses. I know you were generous to everybody with money, but it was from you that I learned really nice manners. And that's what makes one a lady, isn't it? You see, it was so very difficult for me with the example Professor Higgins always before me. I was brought up to be just like him, unable to control myself and using bad language with the slightest provocation. I should never have known that ladies and gentlemen didn't behave that way if you hadn't been there. Well! Oh, <laughs> that's only his way, you know. He doesn't mean it. I didn't mean it either when I was a flower girl. But I did it. And that's what makes a difference after all. <laughs> no doubt. Uh, still, he taught you to speak, and I couldn't have done that. Of course. That is his profession. <laughs> it was like learning to dance in a fashionable way. There was nothing more in it than that. But you want to know it began my real education? What? You're calling me Miss Doolittle that day when I first came to Wimpole Street. 
That was the beginning of self-respect for me. And there were a hundred little things you never noticed because they came naturally to you. Things about standing up, taking off your hat, and opening doors. Oh, that was nothing. Yes. Things that showed you thought and felt about me as if I was something better than a scullery maid. Though, of course, you would have been just the same to a scullery maid had she been shown to the drawing room. You never took off your boots in the dining room when I was there. Oh, you mustn't mind that. He takes off his boots all over the place. I know. I'm not blaming him. It is his way, isn't it? But it made such a difference to me that you didn't do it. You see, really and truly, apart from what anyone could pick up, the dressing and the proper way of speaking and so on, the real difference between a lady and a flower girl is not in how she behaves, but in how she's treated. I shall always be a flower girl to Professor Higgins because he always treats me as a flower girl and always will. But I can be a lady to you because you always treat me as a lady and always will. Please don't grind your teeth, Henry. <laughs> this is really very nice of you, Miss Doolittle. I should like you to call me Eliza now. Oh, thank you, Eliza, of course. And I should like Professor Higgins to call me Miss Doolittle. <laughs> I'll see you damned first. Oh, Henry, Henry. Why don't you slag back at him? Don't stand it. It will do him a lot of good. I can't. I could have done it once before, but I can't go back to it. Last night, when I was wandering about, a girl spoke to me, and I tried to get back to the old way with her, but it was no use. He told me, you know, that when a child was brought to a foreign country, it picks up the language in a few weeks and forgets its own. Well, I'm a child in your country. I've forgotten my language and can only speak yours. That's the real break-off with the corner of Tottenham Court Road. Leaving Wimpole Street finishes it. Oh, but you're coming back to Wimpole Street, aren't you? You'll forgive Higgins. Forgive? We'll see, by George. Let her go. Let her see how she can do without us. She'll relapse into the gutter in three weeks without me at her elbow. He's incorrigible, Eliza. You won't relapse, will you? No. Hmm. Not me. Never again. I've learnt my lesson. I don't believe I could utter one of those old sounds if I tried. <laughs> Victory! Victory! <laughs> Can you blame the girl? Don't look at me like that, Eliza. It ain't my fault I'll come at this some money. You must have touched a millionaire this time, Dad. I have. But I'm dressed something special today. Born to St. George's and over square. Your stepmother is going to marry me. You're going to bring yourself down to marry that low common woman? He ought to, Eliza. Why has she changed her mind? Intimidated, Colonel, intimidated. Middle class morality claims its victim. <laughs> Won't you put on your hat, Eliza, and come and see me turned off? If the captain says I must, I. I. I'll demean myself and get insulted for my pain when I'm mad. Don't be afraid. She never comes to words with anyone now. Respectability has broke all the spirit out of her. <laughs> <laughs> Be kind to them, Eliza. Make this. Well, to show there's no ill feeling, I'll be back in a moment. I feel uncommon nervous about the ceremony, Colonel. I wish you'd come and see me through it. But you've been through it before, man. You, you were married to Eliza's mother. Who told you that, Colonel? <laughs> well, nobody told me, but I concluded naturally. No, that ain't the natural way. That's the middle class way. My way was always the undeserving way. But don't say nothing to Eliza, she don't know. Always had a delicacy about telling her. Quite right. We'll leave it so, if you don't mind. Then you'll come to the church, Colonel, and put me through straight? With pleasure, as far as a bachelor can. May I come, Mr. Doolittle? I should be very sorry to miss your wedding. Oh, I should indeed be honoured by your condescension, Mum. <laughs> <laughs> My poor old woman will take this a tremendous compliment. She's been very loud, thinking of the happy days that are no more. I'm going to the church yet, Jenny. I've got me more than 15 minutes. I'm going to the church to see your father married, Eliza. You have made a covenant of brewer with me. Colonel Pickery can go on with the bride goes. Right, bro. Blimey, what a word. Makes a man realise his position. <laughs> Before I go, uh, do forgive him and come back to us. I don't think Papa would allow it, would you, Dad? Don't play you off, Colonel Eliza, don't you, sportsman. 
If it had been only one of them, you could have nailed them. But you see, there was two, so one of them chaperoned the other, as you might say. It was awful of you, Colonel, but I bear no malice. I should have done the same thing myself. I've been the victim of one woman after another all my life. So I don't grudge it to you, get the better of you, Liza. I shan't interfere. Time for us to go, Colonel. <laughs> so long, Henry! <laughs> See you in St. George's, Eliza. Do stay with us. Eliza, you've got a bit of your own back, as you call it. Have you had enough, and are you going to be reasonable, or do you want any more? You want me back only to pick up your slippers and put up with your tempers and fetch and carry for you. I haven't said I wanted you back at all. Indeed. Uh, then what are we talking about? About you, not about me. If you come back, I shall treat you just as I have always treated you. Can't change my nature, and I have no intention of changing my manners. My manners are exactly the same as Colonel Pickering's. That's not true. He treats a flower girl as if she was a duchess. And I treat a duchess as if she was a flower girl. <laughs> I see. The same to everybody. Just so. Like father. Why well, I am not accepting the comparison at all points, Eliza. It is quite true that your father is not a snob and shall be quite comfortable in whatever station his in life that his uh, eccentric destiny may call him. The great secret, Eliza, is not whether you have bad manners or good manners or any particular sort of manners, but that you have the same manner towards all human souls. In short, you behave as if you were in heaven where there are no third-class characters and one soul is as good as another. Amen. You are a born creature. The question is not whether I treat you rudely, but whether you have ever heard me treat anyone else better. I don't care how you treat me. I don't mind your swearing at me. I wouldn't mind a black eye I've had before this, but I won't be passed over. Well, well, then get out of my way, for I won't stop for you. You talk about me as if I were a motor bus. So you are a motor bus. All bounce and go and no consideration for anyone. But I can do without you. Don't you think I can't? I know you can. I told you, you could. I know you did, you brute. You wanted to get rid of me. Liar. Thank you. You never asked yourself, I suppose, whether I could do without you. Don't try to get round me. You'll have to do without me. I can do without anybody. I've got my own soul, my own spark of divine fire. But I shall miss you, Eliza. I have learned something from your idiotic notions. I confess that humbly. <laughs> and I've grown accustomed to your voice and appearance. I, I like them, Father. Well, you have them both on your gramophone and in your book of photographs. When you get lonely without me, you can turn the machine on. It's got no feelings to hurt. I can't turn your soul on. Leave me those feelings, and you can take away the voice. Oh, you are a devil. You could twist the heart of a girl as easy as one might twist her arms to hurt her. Mrs. Pierce warned me. Time and again she's tried to leave and you always got round to the last minute. And you don't care a bit for her. And you don't care a bit for me. I care for life. For humanity. And you're part of it that has come my way and been built into my house. What more can you or anyone ask? I won't care for anybody that doesn't care for me. Commercial principles, Eliza. Like solo boilers, isn't it? Don't sneer at me. It's mean to sneer at I me. I have never sneered in my life. Sneering becomes neither the human soul nor the new human face. I was merely expressing my righteous indignation about commercialism. I don't and won't trade in affection. You call me a brute because you couldn't buy a claim on me by... Uh, fetching my slippers and finding my spectacles? Well, you were a fool. I think a woman fetching a man's slippers is a disgusting sight. Did I ever fetch your slippers? I think a good deal more of you for having thrown them in my face. 
No use saving for me and then asking to be cared for. Who cares for a save? If you come back, come back for the sake of good fellowship. Well, that's all you get. And you've had a thousand times more out of me than I've had out of you. And if you dare to set up your little dog's tricks of fetching and carrying slippers against my creation of a Duchess Eliza, I'll slam the door in your silly face. What did you do it for if you didn't care for me? Well, because it was my job. You never thought of the trouble it would make for me. Would the world have ever been made if its maker had been worried about making trouble? Making life means making trouble. The only way of escaping trouble is by killing things. Cowards, you notice, are always shrieking about having troublesome people killed. I'm no preacher. I don't notice things like that. I notice that you don't notice me. Uh, Eliza, you're an idiot. <laughs> I waste the treasures of my Miltonic mind by spreading them before you. Once for all, understand that I do go my way and do my work without caring tuppence what happens to either of us. I am not intimidated like your father and your stepmother. So come back or go to the devil, which you please. What am I to come back for? For the fun of it. That's why I took you on. And you may throw me out tomorrow if I don't do everything you want me to? Yes, and you may walk out tomorrow if, you, if I don't do everything you want me to. And live with my stepmother? Yes. Or sell flowers. Oh. If only I could go back to my flower basket. I'd be independent of both you and father and all the world. Why did you take my independence from me? Why did I give it up? I'm a slave now for all my fine clothes. Oh, not a bit. I'll adopt you as my daughter and settle money on you if you like. Or would you rather marry Pippi? <laughs> I would marry you if you ask me and you're nearer my age than what he is. Uh, then he is, not then what he is. I'll talk as I like and not my teacher now. I don't suppose Pickering would, though. He's as confirmed an old bachelor as I am. That's not what I want and don't you think it. I've always had chaps enough want to be that way. Freddie Hill writes to me two and three times a day, sheets and sheets. Damn his impudence! <laughs> he has a right to if he likes poor lad, and he does love me. You have no right to encourage him. Every girl has the right to be loved. What? By fools like that? Freddie's not a fool, and if he's weak and poor and wants me, maybe he'd make me happier than my betters who bully me and don't want me. Can he make anything of you? That's the point. Perhaps I could make something of him. But I never thought of us making anything of one another, and you never think of anything else. I only want to be natural. In short, you want me to be as infatuated about you as Freddie, is that it? No, I don't. And don't you be too sure of yourself or of me. I could have been a bad girl had I liked. I've seen more than some things than you for all your learning. Girls like me can drag gentlemen down to make up for them easy enough. And they wish each other dead the next minute. Well, of course they do. Then what in thunder are we all quarreling about? I want a little kindness. I know I'm only a common ignorant girl and you a book-learned gentleman, but I'm not dirt under your feet. What I done, what I did, was not for the dresses and the taxis. We were pleasant together. And I come, came, to care for you. Not because I want to make love to me and not forgetting the difference between us, but more friendly like. Well, of course. Well, that's just how I feel. And how Pickering feels. Eliza, you're a fool. I don't have a proper answer to give me. Well, it's all you'll get until you stop being a common idiot. If you want to be a lady, you have to give up feeling neglected if the men you know don't spend half their time sniveling over you and the other half give you black eyes. If you can't stand the coldness of my sort of life and the strain of it, go back to the gutter. Work till you're more of a brute than a human being and then cuddle and snuggle and drink till you fall asleep. Oh, it's a fine life, the life of the gutter. It's real. It's warm. It's violent. You can feel it through the thickest skin. You can smell it and taste it without any training or any work. Not like science and literature and art and music. 
Poetry. You find me cold, unfeeling, selfish. Very well then, be off with you to the sort of people you like. Marry some sentimental hog or other with a, a lot of money and a thick pair of lips to kiss you with and a thick pair of boots to kick you with. Can't appreciate what you've got. You better get what you can't appreciate. I can't talk to you. You always turn everything against me, always in the wrong. You know all the time you're nothing but a bully. You know I can't go back to the gutter, as you call it. And that I have no real friends in the world but you and the Colonel. You know well I can bear to live with a low common man after you, too. And it's wicked and cruel of you to insult me by pretending that I could. Do you think I must go back to Wimpole Street because I have nowhere else to go but father's? But don't you be too sure you'll have me under your feet to be talked down and trampled on. I'll marry Freddy, I will, as soon as he's able to support me. Rubbish! You shall marry an ambassador. You shall marry the Governor General of India, the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland. But somebody who wants a deputy queen. I'll not have my masterpiece thrown away on Freddy. You think I'd like you to say that? I forgot what you said a minute ago. And I won't be coaxed around as if I was a baby or a puppy. I can't have kindness. I'll have independence. Independence? It's middle class blasphemy. <laughs> we are all dependent on one another, every soul of us on earth. I'll let you see whether I'm dependent on you. If you can preach, I can teach. I'll go and be a teacher. <laughs> what do you teach in heaven's name? What you taught me. I'll teach phonetics. <laughs> <laughs> I'll offer myself as an assistant to Professor Nepean. What? <laughs> that imposter? That humbug? That chewing ignoramus? <laughs> Who teach him my discoveries? My methods? Take one step in his direction, and I'll ring your neck to him! Ring away, what do I care? <laughs> I knew you'd strike me someday. Oh, don't bother, Mother. 
Super is hem al reizen, hè? Goodbye!